Hello and welcome to the Argyle Financial Controller Forum. My name is Vicki Lynn Brunskill with Argyle. It's great to have everyone joining us today. Just a couple of notes before I turn things over to our panel moderator. First, a quick reminder to stop by our sponsors' virtual booths at any time during today's event and for the following week. Our partners are committed to providing you with valuable content and a great overall experience today. At any time during today's event, you can visit their virtual booths from the main agenda page. And those booths include complimentary materials, information, and meet and greet opportunities. To ask questions throughout this session and all sessions today, simply type into the Q&A chat, and we will address your questions at the end of the session. And now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our moderator for this wonderful panel discussion, Lou Fanzini, Chief Financial Officer. We are so excited to have Lou and our panelists for a, a discussion titled Financial Controllers and Digital Transformation. Welcome, Lou, and over to you. Thank you, Vicki Lynn. As Vicki Lynn mentioned, um, your moderator, Lou Fanzini, we have a distinguished panel today, Brenna Albert and Paul Adamson. And as Vicki Lynn mentioned, uh, please feel free to submit questions as we go along, as we would like to make this as interactive as possible. And with that said, I'd like each panelist to introduce themselves and maybe Paul, you could start. Hey, thank you for letting me go first. I guess we're, we're doing a alpha order here. Uh, so everyone, my name is Paul Adamson. I work at Amazon as a finance manager and a financial controller. I've been in operations finance uh, my entire career here at Amazon. I used to run FC, so um, you guys are welcome from getting those packages on time, doing that labor management and financial management there. And then now I oversee supplier diversity and inclusion uh, for Amazon. Um, so making sure that we have a good pathway of diverse and small owned businesses to, to win contracts and businesses uh, opportunities with Amazon. All right, fantastic. And it's uh, rare that someone beats me in the alphabetical order game. So <laughs> those to you, Paul. Uh, so uh, great to, to be here today with everyone. My name is Brenna Albert. I'm VP Global Controller at Medline Industries. So Medline is one of the world's largest distributors and manufacturers of medical surgical products running uh, the whole gamut uh, of the supply chain uh, for healthcare. So uh, my history, I have been with companies that have gone through the transformation from a privately held company to a publicly traded company. So done a couple of IPOs and, and built teams, process systems and controls to help companies through that journey a couple of different times. Uh, prior to that, my history is really with large Fortune 500 companies in corporate accounting, technical accounting, and external financial reporting. And very excited about the topic today. And I think it's very salient um, you know, for all of us in this call. Excellent. Thank you both. And I'm really excited to have this discussion today. And I think to start, could we talk about from your experience, have you seen organizations, how have you seen the organizations approach digital transformation initiatives? Maybe we could start with Brenna. Yeah, I think that's such an interesting question. And, you know, I have been with typically larger firms, but also have some experience in the startup world as well, and, and kind of seen the gamut of, of firms of different stages in their in their life cycle. So, uh, and we'll talk, I think, a little bit more probably in, um, in a little bit about best practice, but I, I would say that I've seen a variety of approaches and strategies, you know, for, for digital transformation in, in practice. So, you know, from for example, a company saying, hey, we're, you know, we're really committed to one ERP vendor and for every part of our financial reporting process and other adjacent processes, we'll go with that vendor, right? And, you know, that's how we're going to simplify our process, right? You know, we pick what we think is the best solution, you know, broadly, and then any bolt-on systems or adjacent systems will go with that same provider, right? So kind of streamlining from that perspective. Uh, and then I've seen kind of on another side of the spectrum, just really decentralized approaches to this, right? So more ground, you know, kind of ground, uh, grassroots and, um, you know, building from the ground up, you know, individual teams identifying, you know, opportunities to simplify process, right? Automate, you know, all the, these buzzwords, right? Uh, you know, we're all very familiar with. So a very decentralized approach, you know, so I've seen sort of both sides of the spectrum. And, you know, what I've seen work um, 
pretty well in the past is I wouldn't say mar quite marrying those two, um, you know, but certainly uh, companies that I've seen that have been more successful at this have some kind of a centralized vision and story. You know, what is it that we're trying to accomplish with this and really get folks engaged and, and on board, you know, with digital transformation and how it will help us, you know, serve our customers better and in a way that fits, you know, the, uh, the culture and the ways of working at the company, you know. Uh, so yeah, I've seen a lot of different things in practice, and I know we'll get into a little more of that um, as we continue the conversation. Well, she she said it in a nice way, so I'm gonna say it in uh, the more straightforward way. We've seen people implement it good, bad, or sometimes very, very bad. Um, a lot of it is the human side of it, which is um, the reluctance to change and how they manage that change. Uh, a lot of things have been historical ways of doing things that have worked. And technically, some people have the mindset of if it's not broken, why fix it? But as we try to say like, hey, this may work, but this may not be the most optimal solution as we move forward and being able to break those thought processes to get to what is the most optimal space. Um, and I think one of the greatest kind of spurs to get people to see more optimal solutions has been the pandemic and the need because they've been forced to change versus before where they could get by with some archaic methods or even just running an organization on Excel sheets, right? So like, how do we get this in a way that is still accessible from multiple points of contact across the globe in real time um, as we make decisions, as uh, Ms. Albert said poignantly, to, to best serve our customers? So, so Paul, just just to follow up on that, Brenna was saying that she was thinking that there that she's seen successfully a decentralized approach versus more of um I'll call it a top down approach. Mm -hmm. What what have you seen as far as that's concerned? I've seen a hybrid. Um, so it just depends on the situation. Decentralization works in certain areas and solves certain problems. Centralization works for other areas. Um, so in my current role, I work in a very centralized, decentralized environment where you have essentially one huge umbrella of a company that has multiple subsets and pretty much it's a conglomerate of startups. Uh, so when you look at that, the greatness of having the ability to have autonomy, to create innovation, to get to the most optimal solution that fits your specific customer base really works well for individual segments. But when you try to pull these things across divisions and across reporting segments or across companies, um, you need that centralizing force, as, as Ms. Albert said, to have a clear vision of how do we get to a path forward? Because you will have competing interests and you will have conflicts and you have to find the most optimal solution for everyone. And decentralization, unfortunately, creates um, a selfishness and a good selfishness because you're directly focused on your customer and how you deliver for your customer. Um, and if it doesn't directly impact your customer, you may not develop your systems in a way that's gonna suit other customers. Uh, so you have these uh, pros and cons that are developed as you try to pull in these decentralized forms into a more centralized viewpoint. But if you can, um, of course, the decentralized piece is easier and faster because there's less bureaucracy in terms of the change implementation process there's fewer decision makers uh, and you can implement the change faster because you're dealing with a smaller population base. The centralized space takes longer, but ultimately it's more of a compromise than it is like a straightforward, this is what's best, this is how we're gonna do this. It's more like, how can I get the most good while mitigating uh, all of the different risk factors that will take me away from the most optimal solution? Yeah, I think that's a great, great way to put it. Um, if it's too centrally driven, then you really risk, I think, suboptimal solutions, also frustrating folks on the ground who probably have the best perspective on what the challenges are and what their customers want and need, right? So, you know, one, one company that I work with that I mentioned where it was, hey, this, our way or the highway, we're going to use this ERP provider solutions for everything. 
right? It doesn't matter necessarily if maybe some other tools are, are superior and they could, they could, you know, connect or have API into our systems, maybe be more efficient. It was, no, this is our approach and, you know, everyone's just going to kind of accept that around the organization. I mean, there are advantages to that from a cost standpoint, for example, right? There could be, uh, but really that, that you know, it, it caused a lot of frustration, you know, because it was hard to get teams on board, you know, with that, uh, when it just seemed like there was no room for dialogue, right? You know, um, and, and something that I, I like when I was, you know, uh, kind of reading up to prepare for our conversation today, um, you know, McKinsey and some other resources, you know, something that was really highlighted, um, you know, uh, among all these resources was having a change story, right? And, and that's part of overall change management and, and strategy there. So, but what was funny in this example is that this company had a clear change story, right? But, it, you know, folks weren't necessarily on board you know, with that. So, you know, I do think this hybrid approach is what I've seen be more successful, where you have a central vision, you know, um, for what you're trying to do broadly and focusing on the customer, right? You know, align with the values of the organization, but also having that ground up process where you're giving people opportunity to identify ways to change old ways of working, you know, challenge the status quo and come up with solutions that, you know, serve the customer. Right. And, 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 you know, brings in the room for that dialogue and, and that collaboration. Well, we, we've talked a bit about approach, but what does a successful digital transformation implementation look like? I don't mind jumping in here first. Uh, a successful one is the one that uh, you get the most buy-in from and you execute towards and you meet the deadline for that. Right. So, um, it can be the most optimal solution. It could be the, the most unoptimal solution, but in terms of getting it across, it's really about having alignment on the company vision, getting buy-in from all the key stakeholders and developing a solution that most people can maintain and execute towards. And if you can do that, you can always reiterate to improve on those processes and you'll have to go through that, you know, churn of, of going through that process again uh, but essentially, it's it's a hard thing, especially as controllers, where we may know that this is better, but based on the overall buy-in that you get from the other key stakeholders and decision makers, like, ultimately, you have to do what's in the best interest in the company, but also in the best interest of making the progress to go forward to get to what you know is right. Yeah, and I would, I would add on to that. Um, you know, digital transformation, of course, is a journey. You know, we'll, we're never, we're, we will continue to iterate, we'll continue to improve. And I would think that a successful digital transformation project would have that as an outcome, right? Like where we've created a culture of, you know, of innovation, simplification, you know, technology as an enabler, you know, to provide the best customer experience, right? You know, we, we will have created a culture, you know, or help foster and gender that culture if we have a successful project. You know, we should have people, you know, bought into this. Uh, I also would say that we should have some measurable outcomes as well, you know, so time to serve, like what, you know, what did that do to our service levels, for example? And, you know, my company is interesting where we have a, we have great service levels, uh, not to, not to pitch us, but, you know, during the pandemic, you know, the, the strength of our, you know, our supply chain relationships and our efficiencies really helped us stand out. Um, you know, so not not kind of losing sight of those, you know, those things and, and making sure that, hey, there's measurable improvements here, right, in the way that we're able to, you know, meet customer needs. And that's, that includes internal customers, right, uh, reduce cost, you know, and, and create efficiencies within the organization. You know, sometimes uh, we could get to a good outcome in the wrong way. Uh, right. So maybe we improve service levels, but that means we threw more manual efforts at something. Right. You know, so I would I think that our KPIs also, you know, have to be more than just numbers. We have to understand the process, you know, that, that we undertook to get to those outcomes, you know, uh, and what's the true cost of the organization. I always say that if we uh, if we're working, you know, um, 60 hours, right, to do a five day close, we don't really have a five day close. Right. <laughs> so, you know, um, that, that's not how things should work. Right. You know, we, we need to get to those good outcomes in the right way. So kind of to summarize, you know, I do think you should have measure, you know, measures, things that you're looking to improve. Right. That has to be very important, making sure that, you know, if we see improvements in those measures, we got there the way that we intended to. 
great. Uh, we got there hopefully on time and on budget. <laughs> we all know that that can that can vary in practice. But then I think really importantly, we've you know helped foster a culture where you know folks buy into this change. We want to continue to innovate, simplify, you know, and create improvements in our processes to get better uh, outcomes for customers and stakeholders. And, and you bring up a good point as far as the measurable impact question comes up as to how do you encourage your senior leadership to embrace new technology, particularly when there may be times that the uh, a similar implementation hadn't gone as well? So I don't mind jumping in here. I see you also go on Miss Albert, but um, if you want to go first, ladies first, of course. No, go, go, go ahead. Oh. Um, so in order to get the C-suite buy-in to, to go with any project or implementation, you have to treat them as though they're the customer. In treating them as though they're the customer, you're going to see what speaks to them and what they determine as valuable. And then you will then line up not only the project and the scope of that project to match those things and create a, a compelling value proposition, but as uh, Ms. Albert said, you'll give them measurable things and speak to them in terms of uh, smart goals. It's like we like to call them here on our side of town. Um, but just measurable items that you can give them and the data that reflects that you conducted thorough research on the analysis and the impact that it's going to have that speaks to them as a customer. Um, when you do that, um, even though it, it may be hard because some of this data may not be relatively available or it may be abstract in nature, but if you can speak to them, you'll be able to get whatever you need done. Um, but it's just about knowing your customer up at the end of the day. Yeah, I absolutely agree. You know, knowing knowing the customer, knowing the audience, right, and you know, aligning the priorities of the project with the priorities of your stakeholders. So that includes C-suite, um, for sure. And again, you know, I mentioned before, like making sure that what we're trying to accomplish is in line with the the values and culture of the organization and focused on the customer. You know, one thing I would add to that is, you know, there are also times where you know, we, we need to move towards digital transformation or implementing certain tools or processes that are more compliance, you know, focused in nature, right? And that can be a real challenge, I think, um, you know, for those of us in controllership roles and when trying to get that senior leadership buy-in, you know? So for example, I, you know, I have a history with companies that are private, um, you know, and the potential of moving to, towards a public offering. And that's a really interesting line to kind of walk, you know, where it's, hey, you know, it, in the future, you know, we may be a public company, we should really start thinking about when we implement a technology solution, do they have those, uh, I throw some, some accounting language in there, accounting and audit, you know, SOC type one and two reports, right? How, how do these tools function and support a robust internal controls, you know, environment, for example, right? And, you know, a challenge can be, you know, um, focusing on compliance and making sure that, you know, we're, we're, you know, checking the boxes that we need to check, but grounding those things uh, in, in a way and in language that your leaders understand and helping them understand the value that these compliance and controls, you know, type uh, projects can have, you know, on the business, right? So if we implement a better process in our ERP for tracking project spend, you know, for example, and creating approvals and having all that be documented, you know, not only is that a better from an internal control standpoint, it's also providing, you know, real time data for, you know, uh, from a reporting standpoint to budget, right? So just helping, you know, the senior leaders see that, you know, implementing maybe a superior tool that has, you know, the checks the boxes for your SOC reports and, and things like that and has best practices for controls that has value to the business as well, you know, uh, because obviously in, in, control, in the controllership world, we balance, you know, supporting our stakeholders with clients mindset, right? Like we're always going to have to strike that balance. And I think with, you know, digital transformations, you know, there, we have to help our leaders understand that there could be a tipping point, right? We may choose one solution over the other because one is superior from like a client standpoint or control standpoint, right? You know, it, it serves that need as well. Um, so reminding them of the importance of that, but helping them be grounded in, this will also help the business be more effective as well. And if I may add to that, it's, it's more so in like communicating it in terms of risk. So when you speak of it, like here's the risk of us not doing X, Y, and Z. Right. And that also can help you get through if you can't speak to them in terms of 
a way that they can see the value in it. Fear is also a great motivator. So you can say, here's the punishment if we don't do this type of decision or if we don't move with this certain provider or if we don't put in place these different systems. Here's what we currently do and here's how much time we would have before this may become a potential risk. And I, I find that path to be a great second option to get things across as um, they're always trying to look around corners and prevent headaches. Uh, so a really great executive is if they hear the first way, cool. If they don't hear it the second way, then you may want you know, to start looking at more things than just digital transformation. Right, absolutely. And and that risk can be hard to quantify, but it definitely should be included in your business case, right? When we're thinking about the ROI on a project, you know, if we have a significant risk, either an economic risk or a compliance risk, then that can change the numbers and, and the economics of a decision, you know, in a, in a market way. No, I think that's a great point. So you both talked a little bit about tools, but but as finance leaders, how do you determine the right tools or the technologies for the organization? I can kick off this one. Um, and, and again, I've been with companies of different different sizes and, you know, with some different areas of, of focus in their culture. So, you know, I think you need to, to have a strategy when t- selecting tools um, and not think in the short term, um, you know, and think, think in the long term of where is your business going? What is our overall strategy, you know, for technology in general? And then what tools kind of fit the bill for those? Um, and, and I've been in, you know, again, larger firms, smaller firms, right? So, for example, it, when I was with a smaller company where we were a booming startup, right, just you know, incredible revenue growth, great expansion, tons of M&A, right? There were points in time in our life cycle where we were, you know, we were kind of young and scrappy and, you know, fighting for every, you know, dollar, right? So we had to kind of tier our digital uh, transformation and finance system implementations based on that, right? Like, hey, what do we need to just get us from an AP standpoint, for example, right? We're growing like crazy. You know, what do we need from an AP workflow standpoint that's inexpensive and fast to implement? And that's going to be our solution for the next 12 to 24 months. And then where do we want to be, you know, 24 months to, you know, five years from now, right? And what does that roadmap look like? So just understanding where your business is and, you know, what are the looking at impact versus effort and what's kind of going to get you there. Right. So, you know, there could be times and, you know, I've experienced this where, Hey, we have an immediate issue we need to solve, right? Like we're struggling with these AP payments. We have a completely manual process. that's not sustainable. You know, is there something we can do immediately that will have an impact? Right. And then, you know, is then we determine what the long-term solution is. You know, um, if you're at a company that's more established, right, you have more runway for these things, you don't have these immediate risks or issues you're trying to work with, then I really think you need to think, you know, focus on the long term. You know, think about is this the right tool for us two years from now, five years, five years from now? You know, does this tool fit into our overall ecosystem, right? Or what are the major systems that we have at the company and how do these tools interact, you know, with, with those systems? You know, um, and I'll, I'll point back to the example that I had uh, where, you know, we, we at this one company um, that I was working with, you know, we would just choose the, the same provider for everything, right? You know, uh, right, that may not be the right solution, but thinking about, okay, well, our ERP is System X, right? How do these tools interact with System X, right? Is, is there customization involved? Is there configuration involved? And what are people used to working with? Um, and then if there's an overall system roadmap for ERP, certainly thinking about how these other solutions fit into that. You know, something that I, I like to think about is, you know, every ERP, you know, it will go through iterations. It'll be a certain point in time where you need to upgrade it, you know, and uh, in a good tr- digital transformation, you know, environment, if you have a good strategy, these other solutions can actually help you with change management. So for example, if you've got, uh, a black line or a trend tech or a flow cast, you know, whatever the size of your organization and people are used to working in those solutions, like those solutions can actually help bridge the gap if you implement a new ERP, right? Because people are used to looking at their balance sheet reconciliations or their, you know, um, looking at their closed checklist or submitting journal entries to these systems and they're used to using these systems. These are a system of controls and help you manage your close and then they'll bolt into the next ERP, right? So just thinking overall about your, your roadmap and your landscape and thinking long-term, you know, about these things, I think is super critical. 
I mean, you answered that perfectly. I don't have anything else to add for, to that. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Albert. <laughs> well, great. And, you know, as we're talking about tools, we're talking about technologies, maybe I'll, I'll ask Paul this question or to start with this question. Have, what sort of technology have you considered? Do, have you considered AI? Have you considered machine learning? Have you considered RPA? And if so, how... In what areas have you have you used them? Yeah, so we, um, in the company I work for now, we use a lot of machine learning to help kind of uh, fine tune our forecasts and fine tune the way that we plan. Um, for instance, in our warehouses across the country, as we grew in scale significantly during the pandemic, um, the labor wasn't actually able to keep pace with like the rate at which we were growing. So. We couldn't have a one-to-one -one -one financial controller approach to our buildings like we did in the past. And with so, we need to find a solution that would allow us to grow and scale consistently in delivering a consistent planning product across. Uh, so we did it, started to develop tools and mechanisms that were taking historical plans. And as we kept uh, iterating on that system, uh, it was able to fine tune the position where it could carry a consistent product based on a small amount of inputs in, in way faster time. So not only did we were able to scale and, and grow that out, but fine tune the precision and also free up um, tasks that was you know super critical to the business, but didn't necessarily need a, a human's focus and attention to it, to that level of detail um, and able to get that within a 5% variance. Um, so if you can do that and double the size of your, your operational scope, I would consider that a win any day, right? Um, but it's things like that as you as you look at it, you have to figure out how can you as humans embrace the technology that exists to streamline and free up time for you to do tasks that you necessarily cannot offload to a machine or cannot offload to a system. Um, so we've been continuously looking at things that we can um, bring either to like the cloud format, um, deprecating Excel as much as possible, moving to um, less human error inputting mechanisms and using more um, forward looking data techniques. And essentially it's all about getting a more streamlined and consistent approach, even within the decentralized environment. Right, um, and then my experience as well, you know, we've certainly had this role in, in prior roles, you know, we've implemented some RPA and machine learning, um, you know, for example, uh, machine learning, things like AP. So there's certain softwares out there that, you know, will learn um, from how AP invoices are coded, how in AP invoices are routed, you know, for approval. Um, so, you know, for a smaller company, you know, we use some of these more emergent technologies with some pretty good success. You know, again, got some, got some quick wins there. You know, RPA, if I just think about some of these manual processes traditionally, um, you know, cash application. I, I mean, I've, I've definitely known companies in the past where cash application, it's such a simple thing, but it can just get out of control, right? If, if there are issues there and, you know, then you're just unwinding and digging into so much detailed data to try to fix it. So, you know, we focused, um, you know, here at, here at Medline on, you know, using bots for those types of areas, right? So these transactional areas where we can automate, you know, 80, 90, 90% you know, of some of these processes by effective use of, of RPA. Um, and always looking for more opportunities, again, to, to simplify and, and create efficiencies. So um, I don't know if others have anything else to add there, but I, you know, I, I don't think that we're, we're, you know, doing the right things if we're not considering, you know, certainly how to use these emergent technologies, it, especially also with the challenges that we're facing in the labor market and finance and accounting, um, you know, need to come up with ways to, you know, not only streamline our operations, but also free people up as, as, you know, Paul was saying, for people to do more interesting work, value added work, analysis, and things like that, and just avoid, you know, having this manual intervention wherever possible. I'm glad to see Sarab has joined us. Love, love to hear you on this question. Have you embraced yeah. any new technologies? Yeah, so I think in uh, in the health in years world, Siemens Health in years world, as uh, global organization, we experiment our, ourselves through various automation technologies. 
I think we started with the RPA uh, and it was very important to run through uh, the uh, AP, AR, our dunning processes, our uh, more uh, uh, OTCs, uh, order to cash cycles and P2P cycles that were really important. But I think where we have graduated over years is more towards uh, what we call uh, the power app environment and digitalization and automating our workflows. And I'll just give an example. It's typically related to uh, uh, a simple process here, just to, just to make sure that the, the audience understands is about uh, uh, headcount approvals. Yeah, so we have a global organization and the cost centers and do headcount planning. And um, a, we, uh, in a typical world, we would have all these things individually, they'll be planned on Excels, and then you'll go through collecting the information from HR, and then you would go down to uh, a, a get uh, certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, inputs, approvals, and then uh, they would go, and then the information will go back to our HR systems. Now, the entire workflow is automated using Power BI and Power Apps, which basically means that it's initiated in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a workflow on, a, uh, on an app and it automatically sends an approval matrix. And then once it's done, it's linked up to the HR information and it goes and updates onto your planning cycle. So that entire cost center planning has already improved and it's cut down so much manual intervention and the entire workflow reminders, updates, and the version controls have been updated. So it's a very small example of a use case, but applying power apps and some of these digitalization technologies, uh, a lot of workflows have been automated and simplified. So that was just another example. I mean, I could go on and on in how many of these uh, automation processes have been implemented. Well, you know, we've talked about the approach. We've talked about the type of tools and what are the right tools and and how to get buy-in from your key stakeholders. But and we've talked around some of this. But what are, what are, what what do we think the biggest challenges are for financial controllers as far as digital information is concerned, and 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 how can you overcome them? I would say that the biggest one that I'm seeing is really just the knowledge gap, right? People fear it and the things that they don't understand and they'll push back against those things that they don't feel comfortable and confident in. Um, so not only as financial controllers, but as also of our key stakeholders and our customers, it's up to us to really create an environment where people can feel comfortable about learning why it's important, what are we trying to do, what are we trying to accomplish, and then being able to um, teach the new mechanisms and processes that you have in place so that way people can understand the value that's being driven from it. Um, I think just having transparent conversations, having documented kind of, you know, learning mechanisms, working with your, your talent and development teams or your HR teams at your respective companies to develop uh, resources that people can go back and refer to, whether it be some training mechanism or just vid visual dashboards that have different uh, educational video snapshots. We call them, we typically do like two minute takes. Um, so you can see exactly what it is that you're looking at and understand all of the different things that go into the sausage making um, as they um, look at the new improvements that have come. Now, I think the biggest piece is just really the human piece of reacting to new technology. And a lot of that is just, people just don't know. And it's up to us to teach them. I think that's a great point. Um, I would add that bandwidth, um, you know, can also be a, a challenge for us in controllership during such a transformation. So carving out the time, you know, uh, from the day to day, especially, you know, for companies that are facing challenges with staffing and hiring retention, you know, in this labor environment. So carving out that time, you know, to focus on these transformation projects you know, allowing, you know, backfilling folks' day-to-day -day roles, allowing them to participate in these projects, the true subject matter experts, the folks who are in the details, 
you know, I think that's certainly a challenge, you know, that I've seen is just making sure that, you know, are we, if we are prioritizing this as an organization, then we do need to prioritize it, right? So that means that we need to provide our employees the resources that they need to be successful. I think to Paul's point, that part of that's education and training, you know, and enabling people, you know, uh, to, to learn this technology and embrace it. But I also think that we've got to make some investments, right? So whether that's, you know, temp, temporary employees or consultants who come in and backfill people and allow our, our experts to participate, right? So they're not just doing their normal job after hours, right? Because that can certainly lead to burnout and challenges. So that's, you know, I think there are strategies that companies can undertake, you know, um, and again, to have a successful project and create that culture, you know, where uh, simplification and process improvement and digital transformation are valued, then, you know, the leaders at the top have to commit to that, right? And that means committing resources and, and, you know, committing the funding to support our employees through the process to make sure that there is that bandwidth. Yeah, so I just add to what Paula and Brenna have already said. Um, I would say the biggest challenge I've, forced, uh, I've encountered is around data. Data is abundant, data is created at a very rapid pace, but data is also not usable. So whenever we try to develop applications, we have great plans, but it's taken a lot of time to integrate. We have data lakes, but the usable data is usually in such a state then that it's not easily usable. And then you have to put up a lot of time and effort to cleanse it. Second problem is data ownership. The moment the organizations get into a digital world, the business owns the data, the business finance people, IT owns the data lakes and the processes and the architecture, and then ultimately how they come together, uh, uh, the users uh, find a gap in terms of who owns and is accountable for the entire new application. So that entire clarity and setting it up and making sure that the maintenance is done correctly is one of the biggest challenges I've encountered besides people, bandwidth, and uh, the lack of prioritization and the leadership. But that, that's one thing I would add there. What about from a work from home perspective? So in this culture, now there's hybrid working from home. How do you, how do you train people or how does implementation look when you when you have this type of, of, of work environment? I, I would start, I mean, since uh, a, a, so work from home initially was a nightmare in terms of getting people together and train them. But I'm pleasantly surprised as I speak now, and uh, my colleagues can have a different experience, but as I speak now, uh, people have learned to adapt uh, technologies to work. So as an example, now we are very proficient in using concept board. It's an online tool for collaborate. And there in the concept board, we can exchange ideas, we can online uh, do things and uh, people in smaller groups are able to train. And with the hybrid onset, a couple of days, uh, you could work online and then have uh, a one day of uh, activity together, that's kind of fitting in rather well. We've, we've managed to do that over overseas and with uh, global participation. So two years ago, it was very difficult, but I think last year onwards, the learning uh, curve has been rather well adjusted. I would say to, to echo to one of the points that uh, Sarab made earlier, it's about um, training the people effectively to understand, to, to get to a point of like really being able to create work streams or workflows that streamline the training process. And then um, Ms. Albert also said like in terms of having temporary workers and and part-time persons who may supplement the gap to, to reduce the, the burn on the workforce. It's really having those standard processes and procedures readily available and documented so someone can pick up that work and continue the charge, right? Um, these are things that unfortunately showed in a lot of companies that they didn't have clear documentation. There wasn't clear, concise 
um, owners, as Sharab said, right? Like who owns what and how do they own it? And what are the rules and permissions around how we move and navigate? Um, so now that a lot of that stuff is in place uh, or in flight because it had to be created, if we take that same type of regimen and that same thought process and continue to move forward, uh, we should be able to see uh, tremendous growth and scalability across the financial controller landscape. Um, but it's just continuing to do that. And how can we put more resources into that space in terms of learning, training, and development? Um, and I think there's a, a great opportunity on the learning side, especially as we move to more on-demand learning content. Absolutely. Yeah, nothing more to add. I think those were great points. Great, thanks. Uh, just one other question. You know, we, we've talked about how we're getting people uh, involved and how we're getting leadership to understand what we're trying to do and why, what tools we're using and why we're using them. But what's the best way to effectively communicate that to, to all of your stakeholders? So not just senior leadership to the staff, to your board of directors, uh, especially during times of economic uncertainty, like today where you have inflation going through the roof, you're worried about SG&A costs, you're worried about CapEx costs. How do you effectively communicate the, that, that value? Um, it goes to my earlier point, which is understanding your customer. Each customer is gonna want a different marketing ploy of how you actually sell your message and sell your vision to them. Uh, so employees, you know, at that level, they have more concern of like the job stability, right? Or how is this going to affect raises and bonuses? And how does this really affect me in terms of an individual perspective? Managers are going to want to know how does this affect my team, right? And how is this going to make me change? And how am I going to have to now manage the expectations on my team around these different things? Or how does this change the way that my team works? And then on the C-suite level is more so how does this affect the company as a whole, how does this affect the bottom line? How does this create efficiency? How do I have to then communicate this downwards? What is the timeline? What are the key deliverables that this is going to be measured against in terms of how we determine success or not? And if you're able to understand those kind of main themes at those individual levels, you'll be able to effectively craft your meshes to make it make sense. But if you try to speak to an employee the same way you speak to a CEO, it's probably not gonna work and vice versa. Uh, so you just have to make sure you're having a consistent message that's just tailored specifically to a customer. So maybe I take, uh, yeah, just to uh, piggyback on what Paul's been saying, I think, uh, yes, there is no cookie cutter approach. We have to tackle everyone individually and differently. But my biggest learning has been is create a demo and lead the audience to that aha moment. I think if we understand the problems the stakeholders are going through uh, and we can lead and associate problem solving. So as a perfect example is uh, unity of dashboarding. So we were analyzing the costs and uh, the drivers. And in that process, we would just like, okay, here is, these are top five uh, issues. And then so, suddenly someone said, hey, but by the way, I see that deviation or I see that um, uh, problem there. What's what's driving that? And you say, wait a minute, we can just click on it. And then uh, you see that uh, visualization changes scope and you are easily able to answer those questions. And then within a couple of minutes, the audience was able to look at the aha moments themselves. And then you could just like put couple of those benchmarks together. So visualization is a powerful tool. And once the users are able to visualize the solution in front of them, they're already and obviously enticed towards it. And, um, and, and then we've talked about it briefly in the past, is this the fact that people have problems and if you are part of the solution, you're easily able to get their buy-in. If you come across as cost or pain or effort or work or resource sharing, then uh, there is a, always a lot of resistance to any initiative. So as long as my experience has been, I've always tried to approach it as a problem and a solution 
rather than asking for resources and cost and SGN, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I would say I've not been successful all the time, but more often than not, this approach has been useful. Well, we have about five minutes left and please put any questions that you have. This will be the Q and A session in the chat. I think we've hit a few of them that have already come through, but if there are any more questions, please, please put it in the chat. In, in the meantime, until I start seeing some questions, maybe we can, um, each one of us could share a, any final thoughts and we'll go um, reverse alphabetical order this time. So we'll go with Sarab. Okay, so I'll say uh, digitalization and automation is not a uh, if question anymore. So any audience, and I'm sure people who are here are already aware of it, we have to tackle it earlier the better, and if you're on top of it, it's better. So uh, don't avoid it, confront it, win over it, and it's useful. Those would be my final words. Thank you. I would make a, a couple of points. So, you know, as I mentioned before, making sure that, you know, there there is a change story, uh, which is a popular theme, you know, I think in the, the thought leadership and digital transformation, but that story should be consistent with the success factors and vision of the organization, and it should be customer focused. You know, for us, uh, we focus on technology as an enabler, right, for us to do the things that we do uh, and provide the best customer experience. Um, I think these effective uh, transformation should be focused on simplification, uh, providing data-driven, actionable insights, and, you know, reflect an efficient allocation of the company's resources. You know, um, a, a point I made a couple of times is, you know, an outcome of such a transformation effort should be to have a culture, you know, that embraces this and values this, right? And, and that should pervade all areas of the organization. And people are the foundation of everything that we do. So focusing on the people element of this, so, you know, to, to Srab's point, how will this help solve problems for people across the organization? To Paul's point, approaching each individual, right? And, and you know, how uh, engagement in this project will benefit them. You know, focusing on the people aspect of this is critical and making sure that, you know, if the organization is committed to digital transformation, that leadership is making that investment in people so not only giving them, you know, the bandwidth to participate meaningfully and provide feedback and input into the process, but also training and educating them, right, on how to leverage these technologies and make sure that, you know, they continue to be able to be successful and, you know, their roles can evolve to, you know, more data-driven uh, insight and, and analysis, right, versus the day-to-day, -day, you know, um, transactional type of items that we tend to focus on. Yeah. My, my colleagues pretty much said everything that, that I was going to say. I would just add that the key goal is to remove human error, not to remove the human element. So as we continue to develop and use technology, it's really to mitigate the pain points that come from humans doing tasks that they probably shouldn't be doing anymore. And it's just for us to elevate as a workforce and as a people and in our educational basis to get to that next level and it's not about removing jobs and tasks, it's about finding better jobs and tasks for us to do um, that we can bring more insight to. So that, that's just my main takeaway and just focus on the experience behind the data and not just let that be the job in force. Thank you so much. I, what a terrific panel. Thank you, Brenna, Paul, Lou, and Sarab for such an insightful panel discussion. And I want to thank everyone else, everyone for joining this session today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be available on demand following the event. Thank you again, panelists and moderator Lou. It was terrific. Have a great day.